intro. My name is Ellen. I've been working with Keith for quite a while now. We're really excited that the museum gets to be a part of this 38th anniversary of Food Not Bombs and really learning the history about this beautiful organization. Um, this is part of our Learn series that happens every Wednesday. And we really wanted to have this event center around the stories of the books and how folks who are familiar with Food Not Bombs or very new to Food Not Bombs can really find a way that they're related to Food Not Bombs. And so to take it away. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, yeah, it's been fun organizing these events here. So, um, the, so the reason tomorrow is set to be the founding of Food Not Bombs is there were, um, one of my friends, Brian, was arrested at an anti-nuclear protest in New Hampshire on May 24th at the May 24th occupation attempt of the nuclear power station's construction site. And so that night, the eight people that started Food Not Bombs formed a collective and originally, our idea was to raise money for his legal defense by doing bake sales. And shortly, uh, we really didn't succeed at the bake sales so well until we found a, a poster that said, wouldn't it be a beautiful day if the schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber. So our idea was to, we bought some military uniforms at the Army Navy Surplus Store in Central Square, Cambridge. And we went out with our table and our baked goods, and uh, we had, back then there was like a, in the news a joke about a bolt costing uh, $1,200 for a, a bomber, where you could get it for like five cents at a hardware store. So we had a bolt on the table, and we told people we were making headway towards buying our bomber. And we found that this was a great way to talk to the public about um, our ideas about taking money from uh, Reagan's proposed military budget and instead spend it on things like housing, education, um, health care, things that actually Americans needed. So then, um, so Reagan had just gotten elected shortly after the first few Food Not Bombs actions and uh, we decided to do a, um, I started handing out produce at the housing projects near um, where I was a grocery, I uh, worked in a grocery store. I had all this produce I was starting out. I started taking it to the housing projects. And across the street, there was a new building that just was completed where they had turned out uh, they were designing nuclear weapons. And so it was from that nexus of me giving food and seeing that there's this modern building and that these people really needed to. Uh, needed food and this bake sales that uh, came, we came up with the name Food Not Bombs because it was such an obvious thing. You know, people needing food on one side of the street and people making bombs and not needing food on the other side of the street. And um, then the final thing that became Food Not Bombs and the, the way that you imagine it, you might see it here where we share every Saturday and Sunday at the downtown post office at four is we decided to dress up like hobos and take some of the produce I was taking to the projects and make it into a big pot of soup and hand it out outside the stockholders meeting of the Bank of Boston at the Federal Reserve Bank. And our understanding was that the board of directors of the Bank of Boston were also the board of directors of the nuclear industry, Lockheed, Raytheon, the people building the nuclear power station that we were trying to stop. And that they were basically taking the deposit of money and investing it in their own projects uh, and uh, just to, with very little oversight. And to us it seemed like the kind of thing that led to the Great Depression. So our idea was to look like we, a soup kitchen from the Great Depression. And we had about eight or nine of us cooking and we had this big pot of soup. And then we thought, wow, in the morning we're not really gonna look like a soup line. It'll just be like our friends standing in line dressed up like hobos. So we should find some people that might like this uh, huge pot of soup. And so I went to the Pine Street Inn, which was the only shelter in Boston at the time, and gave a little speech about why we're protesting the Bank of Boston. And they were like, oh, great, a protest like the 60s, that's great. And then they showed up and at noon, and we're having like kind of a party now with these guys from the inn, with workers going by who are stunned that there's a lot of people waiting for food, and, and, and all these things like that going on. And so the guys said, you know, there's no food for homeless people in Boston. Um, you know, 
basically we get a coffee and donuts at the inn when we come in at night, and then we get coffee and donuts when we, when we leave in the morning, but all day long there's no soup kitchens or anything like that. And he said, you should just do this every day. So that night, we were washing up the pots and everything, go, okay, we'll just quit our jobs and do nothing but collect food, take it to people in the projects, and have uh, do street theater with food on the streets and invite the guys at the inn to come eat with us every night at Park Square. So that's uh, what we did. And for the first eight years, it was mostly like puppet shows and music and the festivals. And, and it was not like what we think of today as feeding the hungry. But by the end of eight years, it started to become such that where people were depending on us for food because the policies of Reagan had finally led to massive uh, homelessness. And a lot of Americans don't realize that in 1980, the homelessness was almost non-existent, like maybe roughly 100,000 people in America living on the streets. And it wasn't in the news, people didn't worry about it, there, wasn't, there weren't you know, effort to make lots of laws against homeless people and so on. But um, by 1988, they were starting to make laws about sitting on public sidewalks and sleep, you know, the sleeping laws started becoming more and more um, popular all around the country, banning people from sleeping outside and so on. And so when we went to San Francisco, well, I moved to San Francisco and I started a second group, and I took notes on how I was starting this group just in case somebody wanted to do a third group. And um, on August 15th of 88, riot police came out of Golden Gate Park and the rest of nine of us were serving food without a permit. And we had actually applied for a permit a month earlier and had not heard from the city and thought it was going to be a street performance permit like we have in Cambridge or Harvard Square, which was a you know, just a name, address, and phone number so they could call you if you left your equipment in the, in the, on the street. And um, so that was my anticipation, you know, what I anticipated a permit would be in San Francisco. But as it turned out, uh, they were basically using that as a way of trying to keep us from actually feeding people at the entrance of Golden Gate Park every Monday at noon, which we were excited to be doing. And, um, and so they arrested the nine of us, and they ended up in the news, local newspaper, ended up in the ra uh, some radio and TV program. So people were freaked out and started asking us uh, if they could get arrested with us the next Monday. So we organized a march, we went down the street. People, there was one guy who was carrying a box of melons with a Dr. Spock from Star Trek, like leaning against them, leading us down the street, and um, we set up, and the police arrested. I believe it was 29 people that day, and it, um, um, CNN was there, and it was broadcast worldwide. Right, police arresting people for feeding the hungry at Golden Gate Park. It was in the LA Times, the New York Times, the Times of India, and people started to write letters and call me. Uh, messages at a mailbox, etc. cetera, a phone that I was uh, paying $10 a month for. And um, they had saying they wanted to start a group themselves, they were so upset. So I took my notes, made a flyer, and started mailing it to people so they could start you know, bomb chapters. So every time there's a wave of arrests in San Francisco, there'd be some, a lot of news for a while, and people would be upset, and then we started a new food up on, a bunch of food up on chapters behind that. So by the end, of, by 1995, the city made over a thousand arrests of, of, of volunteers for feeding people. By now, we were like having several hundred Phenom Moms chapters uh, worldwide. And uh, in 92, we decided to have the first Phenom Moms gathering in San Francisco because it was the 500th anniversary of the celebration of uh, Columbus discovering the New World. And indigenous people were calling that 500 years was enough and had a protest. And we thought we'd feed that protest and we'd have a, our first world gathering. And it was at that gathering in October of 92 uh, that we decided we'd have three principles that the food would always be uh, free to anyone, rich or poor, drunk or sober, and it would always be vegan or vegetarian in the case of the patrons and breads. That the second would be, we have no leaders or headquarters, but each group would be autonomous and make decisions by consensus and try to invite people to join the, your, uh, the, the local organization and help determine the direction. And then the third, that we weren't a charity, but that we were uh, dedicated to nonviolent direct action to change society so no one would have to live in the streets or eat in a soup kitchen. And so in the course of all that, 
ultimately, today, we have chapters in roughly a thousand cities of the world and uh, 65 countries. And the, um, the whole uh, groups are connected with the same three principles. They interpret it how it best it goes in their culture. Um, they're, um, we're going to have another program here on Friday that is inspired by the Filipino Food Up Bonds movement, which one of the things they do is they provide uh, uh, soaking tofu with uh, sugar cane curds to children that all gather in the morning. And then one of the two, one or two Food Up Bonds volunteers will have all the kids draw pictures while the rest of the activists are cooking the uh, lunch. And then they would do like a, a photo or art show with all the pictures stuck on the wall of a, t a tin shed or something like that. And all the kids talk about their art. And then they have the big meal. And so we're going to have like on, on Friday, people could come and color in uh, Food Not Bombs uh, logo, put in their own plant that they want to be helpful by the fist and so on. And that was something that I saw in the Philippines that I thought was really impressive. So that would be. Then tomorrow night, we have a concert at the Resource Center for Nonviolence at 6 o'clock. And we'll have snacks that starting at 6. And we'll show some, a bit of videos. But we have um, the Reggae Grammys and uh, a number of bands. We have a list of all the flyer back there. And so hopefully a lot of people show up to that. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we have the regular meals. And this uh, uh, Saturday, it will be like a little festival. And we invite other activist groups to show up and table and, and uh, we'll have music. And that we're calling Soup Stock uh, 2018. And um, so we hope everybody can, can make that as well. And we need volunteers every uh, Saturday and Sunday at 1230 at Indian Joe's at 418 Front Street to help us cut vegetables and fruit and everything. And well, if you can't make it then, we also need volunteers uh, just before 4 o'clock at the downtown post office to help unload the van and set up all the food and help hand that out. And most recently, it would be great to get more volunteers to stay behind uh, after the meal served and help clean all the hotel trays and plots and serving equipment for the um, next time. And, uh, and that can last from as late as uh, 7 o'clock sometimes, unfortunately, it would be great to get help then. So anyway, that's a brief history of Food Not Bombs. And um, you know we've done a lot. We were involved in feeding the survivors of Katrina in New Orleans. We had a big kitchen for Sandy in and, and, um, and Brooklyn. We had a whole meal thing going on on Long Island after Sandy. We provided meals for the first three days after Loma Priega. And it's in uh, Civic Center Plaza. We just uh, had a Food Not Bombs gathering in. Manila uh, in the last like two months. We've got another one down in Tijuana. Right now, Tijuana Food Not Bombs is doing a lot of food support for the caravan. That's something that's going on. Um, with the groups in Te group in Tel Aviv started a project called Anarchists Against the Wall, where they take the wall down between Palestine and Israel. And, um, that's been quite an intense thing for those people. And, and, um, you know, in, in Palestine and Israel. We were involved in, uh, I was told when I went to Iceland that the march, the uh, idea for a march to the apartment building against the economic collapse started as conversations at the Food Not Bombs table, and then they marched from there to the parliament building. Eventually it was like a huge percentage of the total population showing up every Saturday to denounce the government. Eventually it uh, fell, and, um, and some people got died in. So let's uh, you, uh, go on and on and on about stories about food not bonds in parts of the world. Yes. How many people did you feed at Occupy DC and Freedom Plaza? Oh my God, there was like hundreds a every thousand, year. A thousand, I guess. Probably a thousand. Uh, I didn't know you then. But three I, times a I day. I food not bombs. Yeah. <laughs> but then I had the, the opening uh, day of Occupy, well I helped so organize a kitchen at K, uh, K Street, an occupation of uh, McPherson. On October 1st, I was involved in helping organize kitchen for the Wall Street itself, and I ended up going to many food, many um, um, occupies and helping the kitchens and transporting food between one city to the other, and so on. And um, yeah, it was hundreds. And then I had this big pot of, of oatmeal on my 
um, stove inside my van, and the police decided they were going to tow all the vehicles, and I'm like, oh no, you can't tell it. I feel like a and there's a flame in there, and there's you know like 60 quart pot of. I saw oil. that. They let you go. Yeah, I convinced the guy. I was freaking out. They're going to lift up a flaming pot of oil. And then there was a, that was crazy because they had a, probably made, they had the two pukers that they said to me. So the guy come right before I was serving the oatmeal and started throwing up at the beginning of the line and then he would eat the throw up and throw up again and I had to move him out of the area and go get bleach and clean the whole thing before I could start um, breakfast. And then as soon as I got that cleaned up, a second person came and threw up in exactly the same place. And I had to go through it all again. But fortunately, by that time, I had the bleach and everything. But um, that happens on uh, many large protests that I provide food at, that you get the, the puker at the very beginning. It's an unusual uh, strategy, I believe, by the authorities to discourage people. <laughs> yes? Um, I know you guys have stickers. So you can sit down if you want. Oh, no, I'm fine. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I'll sit in a circle. Oh, OK, cool. Um, yeah, we could all just sit closer since we're a small group. Uh, you know, we're open to that. But this is so cute. Is there a good voice? Thank you, Shalom. Um, that's you. On YouTube site, you can go and watch the Anarchists Against the Wall. Oh, there, if you Google Anarchists Against the Wall, they have an amazing documentary that you can get for free on, the, on their website. Yeah. And uh, the when I. So I was on a tour with a filmmaker, and we had played, we did what flew from Istanbul to Tel Aviv, and no Funa Bonds people met us at the airport, and we we're like, wow, that's kind of crazy, and, and uh, so somehow at some point we finally connected with the Funa Bonds kids, and they were in an apartment in Jaffa, editing video, and because that like a few hours before we landed, they did the first action that day. And uh, Israeli Defense Forces surprised them by shooting live ammunition at the protesters, who on uh, the front line were all Jews. And in fact, the person that got hit, Gil, had just gotten out of the Israeli Defense Forces and was shot by one of his comrades for trying to take the fence down. So we spent the night like watching the video of the whole action and giving suggestions on editing. And then we had a big press conference the next day. And, it was huge, huge news in, uh, in, in Israel, and, uh, and they just continued along. And the way they started was a bunch of uh, Food Up Bombs people, or a bunch of people refused to be in the Israeli Defense Forces, and they went to prison. And then some of their friends did go in to the Israeli Defense Forces, and they were disgusted by it. So when they, they decided to have a refusement conference, and they thought, well, we need to feed the people coming to the conference, so we'll start a food up on to be the conference. And at the conference, Palestinian partners said, wow, why don't you come over to West Bank and we'll have a peace camp for uh, two months on the West Bank, and so they, and can food up bombs feed this peace camp? So food up bombs went over and fed the peace camp, and it was during those two months that they decided to create a big ball and it was against the wall. Um, one question I want to ask for all of us, um, just because I want us all to share our own stories too. We're going to be doing this for about 10 minutes so we can transition over to Tony's demonstration and then close it with the final stories of the not bombs, uh, which I forgot to share at the beginning the agenda. <laughs> so it's going to be a key presentation, a conversation about food not bombs, transition to Tony's um, wet play photography demonstration, and transition back to um, storytelling of food not bombs and the question I wanted to ask you all is just what is your connection with food and how does food help you connect with others or what, is help, what does food connect you with whether it's um, your environment, strangers, your family, Every day, as much as possible, as little as possible. 
And even now, when I go out and I get some food, I always see at least one half of it when you get it to the first one person I see. Or if I go to Nickelodeon or Del Mar, I do get the refillable popcorn. I can put it on the top of my nutritional list and then get to the first homeless person. I believe you should always see people all the time when you see them and they're hungry everywhere. Yeah, I'll do that box. <laughs> <laughs> I made just some singing that uh, I came up with when I was uh, meeting uh, in Chambers, Massachusetts a while ago. And this was probably like 2001 or 2002, I think. Uh, we would have been 2000. It was definitely, it was definitely in between those those periods yeah. that, that was my uh, getting on to the streets actually from the uh, But uh, without food, there's no life. And without life, there is no death. And without death, there is no humanity. Wow. That's true. Uh, I had a huge uh, awakening around food uh, about a half a lifetime ago, when I was about 25 or so, and I happened to watch, I happened to stumble across the documentary out of, out of England, on the BBC, about factory farming. I had no idea where the bologna and the hot dogs and the steak and the bacon and all that stuff came from, and I was horrified. And, and immediately, it's like I could never eat chicken or pork or beef ever again. If it's, if it's coming from these conditions, if the animals are being mistreated so severely. That's, yeah, before then, food was food. Food was yummy, didn't think about it. But then I'm suddenly thinking about a lot. There's a natural food store in Costa Mesa where I was living at the time that I paid a lot more attention to. They had the, you know, that was my introduction to the, to the bins of food. And, and that's when I started actually thinking, oh, vegetables are a viable alternative to whatever junk I was eating before then. Uh, so for me, uh, food is political, uh, but it's also uh, the key to health. You know, within, within a few years, I read uh, Food Pharmacy. The first book I, I read when I moved to Santa Cruz was Food Pharmacy: How Food Can Be Used to, you know, directly impact our health and, and strengthen our immune systems. And so, you know, and eventually I read the Food Up, the original Food Up Bonds Manual. We don't have that anymore. Uh, that you know talks about the the, key, the core values. Uh, about bombs, about recovering the stuff that would otherwise be thrown in the in the in the garbage pile, and 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 that sp and that spoke to me because because food waste has always been an irritation for me, and so um, that and also commitment to nonviolence, commitment to veganism, it all rang true for me, and so I've been a volunteer since then. Uh, I can't really relate to food not bombs as such because I don't come from here. I'm just visiting out of Sweden. I have a couple of friends here. Uh, but I'd like to spin off the, the thing that food is political because I, during my growing up and everything, like Sweden is a quite wealthy country. Um, I've never seen 100 people on the street before. But when Romania, Bulgaria entered the EU, European Union, uh, the Roma people start coming to, to Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries living in caravans, living on the streets, begging for food, begging for money. Uh, and after a couple of years, when a big part of the public started to react because there were coming more and more people all the time, because obviously they make more money begging on the streets in Sweden than they do living in Romania because you know the, the racism is quite, quite hard over there, so they don't get any jobs. Then the politicians start talking like we should forbid, we should have laws against giving money, we should have laws against giving food. There's been stories about people because they are often placed outside food shops. And there's been stories about people going in to buy food, opening a can and throwing it on the person sitting outside. Like a lot of these things are happening. At the same time, our Nazi groups are quite growing a bit stronger. Um, and they started a food sharing project uh, in the middle of Stockholm, but they were all serving food to Swedish people. 
So they were like excluding all the Roma people and all the other people who needed help, and therefore, like there was another group coming that was serving for everybody. So that's been a little bit of a a battle, you can say. So yes, it's political. So I just wanted to, you know, <laughs> share that. Otherwise, I don't really have any relations with it. That's so valid. Just thinking about the accessibility of just how yes. it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a privilege to be eating, which is unfortunate because it's like everyone should have the right to a meal, everyone should have the right to drink water and drinking water and all those things because they are medicinal. Food is medicine. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a saying that I've been told a lot and how just someone's health ends up being a political issue and then healthcare. I don't know, it really, it's a root of a lot of things. If someone doesn't have access to food, then what do they have access to? For a whole country to kind of ban someone's access to that, or just it's. We do have groups in Sweden. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> and then also about Nazis, we had um, a group of Nazis come to the St. Petersburg, Russia, food on bombs meal and stab several volunteers while they were serving, and one of them died. And was Timur, and. Um, then, and, and we have not, and it was because we were feeding people that were not, you know, white Russians. And they attacked us for that. And we had um, three other uh, volunteers killed in Russia by Nazis and in the past, like, well, it was mostly around 2005 to 2010. And they also blew up, tried to blow up our meal. Um, in St. Petersburg um, a few months after they killed Timur, but we were late apparently and they blew up a flower kiosk. I got a picture of the bomb and then the you know, hungry for a piece. Yeah, so it's like in Romania, the people like, would huff paint and come to clean up bombs and they would look like middle class. People, you know, and they think, no, we were just so poor. We, these are the clothes we got when we blocked our house, and, and it's, we're so hungry. We just, and they would have all the little kids and everybody in the whole family up in to stave off their, uh, the cold and, uh, and the hunger pain. So it was really sad. And they felt, you know, they were really embarrassed by it, but there was only thing to do since the economy had collapsed. Or, Show actual photos and, and you know, physically. 
and we're going to be shooting digital, so most people don't have photos to actually show and sort of print them out. So it's kind of a treat to be able to have something tactile. And so probably two life-changing things that happened to me are why I did this project. About four years ago, having done photography for most of my life, did you know, started with film, I'm old enough to have done that in high school, and then gone on to film, and I went to film school, I now did digital, I went to film school. And about four years ago, I discovered this process. And I was interested in getting into back into more tactile, hands-on photography, and I got the big view camera you'll see out there, and I was just gonna do sheet film, which was invented by Kodak in the early um, 20th century. I thought I was gonna do that, but you know, I, I did a, you know, spend a little time doing that, and it still wasn't, hands-on enough, and I found out about this thing called wet plate photography, I read about it, it seemed like almost impossible. Like, you have to travel around in the darkroom everywhere you go. I mean, you have to make a film on the spot, and you know, five minutes to take the picture, develop it right there. And uh, I thought I'd just give it a shot, and I took a class from a guy in Colorado who teaches it, and it became very addictive. And I think a lot of people who get into it, they feel that way. It just, you, it's, you feel like you never can get it right, perfect, and you're always trying to achieve, you know, that every picture you take, sometimes you're thrilled with it, but you feel like not only can you do better, but you want a different subject, you know? So it never gets old, and I, I, can, I can shoot all day, I can be hungry and famished, and you know, I just forget about that. I can just get, it's very meditative, you know, because it's so hands-on. It's like, I'm, I, I guess it's like playing an instrument or, you know, doing something like carpentry. You can just kind of get absorbed in it, and so that's why I really love doing it. Um, and then I also like project-based work. So a lot of you know photographers, they always find a subject, which I do, and I love doing that too. Find a person or a landscape and you shoot that once, and that's it. But I really like project-based storytelling, and so that also attracted me to this. And the other life-changing thing about two and a half years ago, as Paul was saying about watching a documentary, I saw a few documentaries that changed my life about food. And um, you know, learned that food can be poison, it can be medicine, it can destroy the earth, it can allow us to live longer if we grow it properly. And um, so having that realization a few years ago and this form of photography, which is also happens to be tied to social justice, this form of photography was invented in 1951. It was used during the American Civil War. So there's a lot of associations with the social justice movements. So, you know, reminding my interest in food and what Food Not Bombs does around plant-based food eating, plant-based eating and then using a photography process that was used historically for social justice. I thought, you know, combining those would really make a good match. And I was up at the mission, uh, right above the post office, doing a, a portrait shoot. And I happened to, you know, look down, and I saw, you know, all the food, uh, the tents and everything. And I thought, you know, I thought I, figured, I thought I could see it was food distribution. And I went down, I spoke with Keith, and um, he spoke about this project, and it sounded like it would be a good match to photograph the volunteers and the people who come to clean up bombs and um, getting some of my bullet points before we go out and take a picture. Um, it's, a, it's a very collaborative process with the subject. So it's, it's not a quick picture that you just take and move on. You have to you know, talk to the person. It takes about 10 minutes to take a picture of the person. So you, you get to talk to them about what they're doing and their background and you know, like explain the photography process to them. So it, it's very collaborative and I you know, allow them to Side sometimes of how they would like to be pictured, and so it's collaborative in that way. Um, it's complex, again, as I said, it's like a lifelong learning process. So there's derivatives of these kind of pictures you see out here. There's other forms of photography I could do that are based on this, so it's like I feel like it could be decades to kind of do it all. And I'll probably do it more right. Um, hands on, unpredictable. I mean, the results sometimes you'll see I hand pour the emulsion, so sometimes depending on the weather, the temperature, humidity, the dust in the air, um, sometimes a, a bug will land on my plate and it'll be there forever, you know, and sometimes it's in the wrong place and I'll reshoot it, but sometimes it looks kind of cool. Um, so a lot can go wrong and sometimes those imperfections add to the interest of the photo. Um, science and history, there's a lot of history about this photography process, I'm actually really interested in that and the science behind it too. So a lot of chemistry, and a lot of uh, cultural history. And then the authenticity, and that can mean a lot of different things. One thing that's interesting about it is the light that reflects off of a person when I take the picture is actually captured on the plate. So unlike digital, 
Um, you know, light does from that person did reflect and go into the camera, but it's so removed, you know, by the time you see the picture. But these pictures, the light, you know, the image that you're seeing was actually the light reflected off that person or subject and captured on the plane. So if you have a hundred year old picture, which I you know, can show you, um, you know, that image, that, that light that's used to capture that picture was actually kind of the photons of light are kind of permanently captured on the plate. So that's an interesting. Do you have color? Uh, well, I, I used to do color, but this, it's, this is only, you know, it's not quite a black and white image, it's more of a sepia tone. And it, your levels of brown or coffee color you get depends on the age of the chemicals, the developer you use, is a lot of variables. Sometimes it does look a little more black and white, sometimes it looks a little more cream coffee color. And that's all. Sure. Why do the pictures have such a presence? Well, um, it, it's, I would say they're almost three dimensional in that there is an emulsion there and it's made up of silver molecules. So, yeah, the picture itself is, is, is just composed of silver, metallic silver. So, different oxidation levels of silver. When I, you'll see me make the film, it goes into a bath of silver and um, the silver reacts with a couple other salts that make light sensitive compounds and the light reacts with that, and what's left on the plate, the exposed areas, um, the lighter areas, the silver stays, and then the darker areas, the silver um, comes off the plate into the solution, the fixer solution. So, um, you know, it's actually uh, it's, it's an emulsion, you know, microns thin, but, you know, the, the silver is actually embedded in it. So it has a little bit of a free image. And the pictures, these pictures were taken on metal plates, aluminum plates. These are called tin types. They were referred to as tin types in the 19th century. You can also take the same uh, process on a glass plate, and those are called amber types. We have a few examples up here. The two framed pictures are amber types. One of the woman is on a piece of red glass. Um, you can't really tell it's red because I put black backing on it. And the other one, the screen, uh, was taken on a piece of green glass. Same process we use today, but um, there's just a lot. You can do colored glass, you can shoot on different colored pieces of metal, you can shoot negatives on clear glass, and then contact print that onto a piece of paper. Um, all kinds of stuff. Well, and let's can talk. I can, and while I'm taking the pictures, I can talk more about the technical yeah. stuff. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. So, what is the camera that you're using? So, today I'm using a, a view camera, an 8x10 view camera. Um, those have been made for the you know, over 150 years they've been making those. This is a modern view camera, um, so same style, but um, had, since it's a newer camera, the movements are a little more fluid and, you know, I have an older camera where the bellows gets really stiff, it gets light leaks, but um, people are still using older, 100-year-old cameras. Um, you can even take what plates on smaller cameras, you can take, I have a kind of a beat-up 35 millimeter camera, if anybody has one of those, you can you know, take a little small butt plate that can go in like a, you know, a piece of jewelry, like on that. Um, even, you know, old Kodak Brownie cameras. As long as you can fit a piece of film in there, you can cut the metal. This, it's so thin, you can almost cut it with scissors or paper cutters. As long as you cut it to the right size, you can pretty much use any camera. Um, I even have an old lens. When I first started out, I was only using this 100 plus year old brass Darlow lens. And I was a little afraid to use a modern lens because nobody was using modern lenses. They were saying that uh, modern lenses, uh, exposure is longer because it has UV coatings. And I started using a modern lens. It's a little more convenient, not as heavy. So today we're probably going to use the modern lens. But a lot of my first two years, I was just using this little, little heavy Darlow lens. Mm -hmm. And there's no shutter inside. So when you take the picture, you have to take the lens cap off and put it on again. <laughs> the exposures are pretty, pretty long. Like today, we're looking at two or three seconds. So it gives you enough time to do that. Let's go over to the demo outside. And um, my interns are going to be the model, but now I am second place in being the model. But if one of y'all wants to take a photo instead of me or with me, that would be great. <laughs> um, yeah, so the demo will be done out here as a little brief break, and then we'll come back in for the final closing little event. Enemies of, of this photography are heat. You know, when he, when he took it, he <laughs> <laughs> so it makes it difficult. Wind is not pleasant, and uh, dust. So what I'm going to do? This is an emulsion. This is called clothing. Um, it's it's basically 
cotton dissolved in ether and um, nothing on its own is light sensitive. I'll show you when I make it light sensitive. So I basically... That's used with contemporary... Uh, um, it's similar. So modern film uses gelatin oh, right. in silver nitrate. Oh. Modern black and white. Oh. What did you say this was? This is called collodion. I didn't hear. What did you say? Anybody, if you smell anything, it's ether. And so it contains um, alcohol and ether and clodion and nitrocellulose. Nitrocellulose, yeah. And that's that's the kind of viscous emulsion that everything kind of sits in. I let it harden just for a little bit. A lot of it, a lot of the process depending on temperature. So if it's really warm out, I would let it sit out less and feel cooler today. So. Mm. Now I'm about to put it into a bath of silver nitrate, 9% silver nitrate. Mm. So the silver is going to react with the, um, the collodion, but what's in the collodion that makes it light sensitive are salts. Cat I have a, a few grams of cadmium bromide and ammonium iodide. Those will react with the silver and they make two different light sensitive compounds, silver iodide and silver bromide. So it sits in there for three minutes. You been a photographer forever? Well, yeah, I've been, you know, since yeah. before, before, even before high school. You know, I've yeah. always been doing it, but, you know, four years this. Mm. So, what's happening now, in, it's, there's a reaction taking place between the silver and the cadmium bromide and ammonium iodide that are embedded in that um, collodion uh, matrix emulsion. And, and so that, those chemicals sound familiar, they're still used. Yeah, yeah, you can buy them. So, Some everything, you know, I, and I, I mix all my chemicals myself, so I buy everything kind of separate in bottles. Well, you and then, when we had photo lab and people could pay to develop their own yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you went there. So, this, yeah, this I was is, scared of all the chemicals. Yeah. This is a little, this is before like Kodak film, so this is oh, yeah. that, oh, but it's God, similar, yeah. similar, oh, yeah. similar concept. So once it's done here, um, after three minutes, it's now light sensitive and I have to, yes. that's why this is, this yes. is a dark room. I I'll, I'll pull the yeah, cloud right. over myself, I'll put on a red light, so it's not oh, sensitive yeah. to red, it's not pan chromatic, it's not sensitive to the entire spectrum. And then I'll load it into a, a plate holder, so face down here. And then we'll bring it over and uh, take the photo. And I'll just get my developer ready. That over there is the developer. And it's orange because it's just iron that is oxidized. Your hair looks different. Have you a bang before? No. I just because... Are you farting? I usually... No, I just let it all out. I, was, oh. I usually end up like that. Oh. I usually end up like that. Let it all hang out. I was wearing a gray for <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, where? Oh, oh, so it's in here. Tail. It's sitting in here for uh, another yeah, minute and a half in the pier. It's soaking. It's just it's soaking. It's it's right. like the, the silver nitrate comes all the way up here. Food, so I can do a plate. You know, that's a small plate yeah, down here. Should so I get you one? Eight by ten. Huh? And then this holder can work different sizes. So this is an adapter for a half plate, four and a quarter by five and a half. I can shoot an eight by ten. I can just stick stick it in here without an adapter. And so, once that's done, I'll go out and take the photo, and then I'll come back in here, and I'll put this developer on it, and then I'll actually see the image come out. Actually, if I connected my laptop, I have a webcam, here more than one, I, I think you can see what I'm doing in here, but when I come back, you won't be able to see it, because I have to put the shroud over myself. Could you do more of them? Yeah, she has time. She wanted to kind of focus on that, but yeah. I'd like to see what you're doing. Sure. Oh, so what we should do now is let's head off to the camera, and I can set that. It's an alien in a space suit. It's precision. I'm 
right? It's what you like. I mean, back in the 18th century, it was 19th century was typical not to smile just because they thought it looked strange, but you know, you're stoic. Rugged individualism. That's pretty nice. That's a Gotta strike a pose for at least three, five seconds. You don't think teeth? I don't think so. I think, so. I think maybe not a teeth a smile. Maybe no, that's no, right. just a yeah, like just you know. A grimace. Think of something pleasant. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we come. Bring the film in. I'll give you a little count. <laughs> it's x rays. So I'll, I'll give you a count of one, two, three, and you'll hear a click, and I'll count two, two or three, and you'll hear another click, and then we're done. Fun. So now I'm going to develop the picture in here. Okay. What I'm doing is pouring the developer on the on the photo, and then I'll start to see an image appear. And I'll be out in about 30 seconds or less. It looks like a negative right now. It's no longer light sensitive because I poured water on it after I developed it. So the moment you pour water on it, it stops all the reaction. Haven't fixed it. Haven't fixed it yet. I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Um, what do you mean fixed it? Um, I'll fix it. I have to get the fixture out. You like to? This is a. So it stops the process. Yeah, this, this now will remove the silver that was unexposed. The unexposed silver, which will become the darker parts of the plate, that silver will come out of solution into the fixer. What's this? That's just, that, that should come off. That's like oxidation with the um, iron and um, basically the developer. The process is also only sensitive to blue light and ultraviolet. That's why it's often hard to photograph like this time of day, it's getting, it's getting, I wouldn't want to sh really shoot too much later than this because we're losing a lot of blue light and ultraviolet light in the atmosphere. It's mostly 
red line. It's fine for digital and film, but this is only sensitive to uh, the bluish and ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Sometimes people's skin can look a little different um, because of that. Freckles tend to show up more. Uh, skin damage tends to show up more. Like people who have had a lot of sunburns in their life, even though they may not look look sunburned when you're taking their picture, that could that can be kind of seen in the skin. Sometimes they'll have dark patches on their forehead or their cheeks. Sometimes Let me get this out. So it's even kind of like a medical test. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, really some, interesting. Some extent, yeah. So it stays on that plate? Yeah, the emulsions. And it's very delicate, so if I were to rub my finger along it, it would just come right off. Mm -hmm. oh. Now what is this? So this is the fixer. This is going to remove the unexposed silver. So the light areas become dark and the dark becomes light. It often takes two shots to get the exposure right, because again, there's so many variables. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's really good. So you have to keep moving it? And yeah, so it's it just because it, it kind of keeps the fresh chemi chemicals over. What we're doing is actually extracting this, the, the cyanide, this potassium cyanide in here is reacting with that silver and pulling it off the plate. So movement kind of just speeds up the reaction. And how can Potassium cyanide? No, that's just water. That's all water. Yeah. How often do you change the solution? This one lasts a long time. I mean, probably a hundred plates before I have to do anything. And you can neutralize um, potassium cyanide with um, hydrogen peroxide. It just mix it with hydrogen peroxide and it neutralizes that. How do you turn it into a positive? Well, um, having it on a piece of black metal, so the metal itself is black, coated black, um, that kind of makes it a positive. Because it is a positive image. It's just, if you were to have it on a piece of clear glass, it would look like a negative. It's really not. Um, a negative. I mean, well, I mean, how do you flip the image so that it's the right way where you want yeah, it? Not a reverse negative? Normally you get a negative. Well, a negative, it. you can make a negative using this process, but you have to uh, tweak the chemicals a little bit. So I would use, I use cadmium bromide and ammonium iodide to change the ratio a little bit. You use a different developer, um, and then you can get what is a true negative. So this is not a negative, this is, a, this is actually a positive image. Well, how do you flip it so that... Oh, flip it? Oh, that, the, the, the camera doesn't have a prism or a mirror in it, so modern cameras... Oh. This sees how your brain sees the image, or your eye, your eye sees the image. When, you're, when images come into your eye, they're actually upside down and backwards, and your brain flips them back again. No, so see, I, don't, I don't get it, Bob, because where the light exposes the film, uh, and you um, activate the, uh, the silver bromide, the developer turns it into silver, right? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? Well, it's already, no, it's already silver, but it's, it's like there's two different forms of silver, oxidized and non-oxidized, and one of those falls off during this process. So where it's black, yeah. you're actually looking through and seeing the back of the plate. The plate is black. See? Yeah. The plate is black. Does it have to be developed longer to get the yeah. bones? Mm -hmm. uh, so Pins? that'll, because it's colder today, it's pretty cold. this is colder. Okay. Um, so so, so we're, where there's no light, the fixer removes the silver and you're seeing the back, yeah, the the back, back of the plate. Yeah. And then where there is light, um, like on her face, um, the silver remains on the plate. Not removed by the fixer. It's not removed. It just, it will, you're converting you, it to something other chemical. No yeah, so it's it's a gradation. So you know, there's pure white, like her shirt. The food not most of the silver stain. You know, in her in her face, you can see some. It's kind of a, it's not a pure white. It's, it's a, some fell off, some stains. It's a it's so a what's gradient. The, so what's the chemical form of where it's white? Good question. That's what I'm. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's 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 either silver oxide. I think it's it's one. Of, that's, I'm trying to actually do a video on the chemistry involved. But most of the books that go into it, they tell you um, what to mix, but they don't tell you the chemistry of what remains in the plate. And what's the cyanide for? Cyanide, it, it, rem it removes the silver. So it was used when they mined for silver, they yeah, actually yeah, use cyanide. Yeah. But when I did photography as a kid, I used it was sodium thiosulfate. Sodium thiosulfate or ammonium thiosulfate, you can use both of those and they work, but the picture doesn't look quite the same and, and the wash time. I would have to wash it a lot longer to get the sodium thiosulfate of ammonium thiosulfate out. With this, very little wash time. I'll replace the water, maybe this much water, I'll replace like three or four times and that's it. And pretty much oh yeah, yeah, so I keep it in here. Um, 
and it's a 1% solution. So for one liter of liquid, I'm using like you know, 10 grams of... Do you touch it to your skin? Not only if you have a cut. So yeah, you don't want to get into a cut. And don't put your fingers in your mouth. Yeah. And what does the... Yeah, that's, yeah, that's just, um, that's, that might be when I took it out of the silver bath and put it on the plate holder, it's wet. And sometimes um, the moisture, the liquid um, that is on the plate um, creates that. And when it's warmer out, um, it tends to um, have a different result. I think, you know, the cooler it is when you put it in the plate holder, the emulsion is still slightly wet. And so things like that can influence. Um, what you see there in the corner, see it's blue. That's a reaction between the uh, developer and the sign. I think it's like a Prussian blue color. You have to really make sure you get all the developer off the plate. I really use wash it really well before I stick it in here because acid and there's iron in there. There's iron in here, and there's also a lot of it's very acidic, glacial acidic acid. So almost vinegar. It's almost pure vinegar with iron. And that's pretty much what it is. What's the pH? It's very low. It's probably one or two. Yeah. Teach classes um, I haven't really taught anything yet, but um, yeah. Progressing toward it. You need um, in the equipment. You um, know, I have one dark room and I have one view camera. I could. I have a bunch of Holga, so I, I was thinking I could teach with a Holga, which is a two by two quarter quarter size, and then um, you know I'd have to probably get a couple more dark rooms, and I'd only probably want to teach it in three or four people at a time. It's kind of hard to teach. Yes. Yes. So you have to be very careful not to get this in here. So there's a wash process. After I develop with this, I completely douse the plate with like a liter of water, and then on top of that, I put it in the water before I'll put it in this water, and then I'll move it. In. Yeah. So what are you doing with the original photos after this? So I, I don't have a plan yet. Yeah, so maybe if Keith has an idea. We, I've talked to them about maybe putting something up, maybe semi-permanently, you know, if we can put some more story to it. Something like that. Maybe I've seen up on some of the semi-permanent exhibits. That's a good tie into what they're doing. Plus, it's sure. art and history. So, over there is a picture of Pierre Bardula, and she's actually the person who introduced me to Fidel Bombs back in about 93, when I attended some forum at the Red Church downtown about homelessness. And so, I, you know, I, I learned a little bit about Fidel Bombs, and I volunteered. And she called me up a week or two later and said, Go to this address. That's what food's being cooked in. So I went there, I had chopped food, and it wasn't a big deal. But, um, but then I, I got a hold of the, like I said earlier, the book on the book on the bonds, and it lays out the foundational value systems and also the basics of how to form the local food on bonds chapter. And I was just very inspired. So all the, the key values were, were key values of my own. Uh, and, uh, and so this is the place I need to be. And also, in fact, it was non hierarchical. It is important to me because I see that as being uh, very damaging to the, you know, very unsustainable as a, as a social mechanism. For, you know, it's very efficient, but it's not sustainable. And so. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I volunteered. I, uh, you know, I was a very active volunteer. I went to get one meal a week, and then we decided to do two meals a week. We decided not only uh, a midday meal uh, on Saturdays, but also a Wednesday morning breakfast at the park, Laurel Park, I know, the Nelson Center. And uh, so that was, you know, that's a, that's a different thing to get up early in the morning and you know, get everything together. And, and uh, there's a shared house out on Ocean Street Extension that allows us, there's a big kitchen for people to allow us to do that. Um, so, and, you know, I have to say that one of the most uh, inspiring aspects of my volunteer work has been um, collecting the food, the, you know, the discarded food from the different uh, vendors and grocery stores. Um, 
it's just, it's just inspiring that they would make the effort to set it aside instead of just tossing the trash cans. That's the committee thing it is. Like, it's in our way, get it out of here. Just, you know. but no, we're going to set it aside, we're going to give you a call, or set up a regular schedule. And sometimes it's just like a massive amount because it's like cosmetically imperfect or the dates are ripened wrong, maybe the product's ripened wrong, and they just, you know, okay, here's eight boxes of bananas, get them out of here. Yeah. And we can, we can tell them that we can make it available to people who, who need it, who are hungry. And, and, and like somebody else was saying, no, no one deserves to, be, to go hungry. Not in the summer of what the society is. So, um, there's a lot of things about, about this work that inspires me. It's, it's something that I can talk forever about. So, if there's a character, if anybody else wants to talk. Ninety-three, I believe. Yeah. You know, I have tried for years to find that movie. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know the title. There are others, though. They're coming out more recently about factory farming. That is, 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 is poignant. This is powerful. What do you do with the food you have to? We try not to have any food left over on Sunday night. And so we actually set out all the extra produce that we didn't have time to prepare. And people come and just shop for free. And but then every once in a while we end up with some extra bread or lump of oil on the produce and then we'll you take it to, I take it to a bar of some Is that a good one? Bye guys. Catch you later. See you guys on Saturday. Okay, cool. I'll no, probably see you guys tomorrow oh. the day after. Yeah, perfect.
You're a chaplain facilitator, Keith. No, I'm a hopefully. I facilitated last week. Yeah, you're a chaplain facilitator with me, yeah. Whoa, this is great. Dude, food on moms well, saved my life in college. Yeah. And we just got moms. In Arcata. Oh, the Arcata food. Yeah, so in 1996, 97, yeah, I was going to the state to uh, start a student, and my whole check went to. Um, the books and rent and, and insurance and none, you know, not even really any money. So you know, that was uh, that was my first run in and then you know all the time freedom seekers. That's all I really wanted to do. And, 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 and so now we got insulinists too, or at least I'm trying to, right? Uh, yeah, they occasionally look like amazing. Well, hopefully it's like, like how I gave you this button and some buttons. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. People love the big buttons. You can see if people have them. Really? Yeah, I noticed you saw a couple left. Yeah, I think uh, okay. not many. It looks high. Yeah. Yeah. The pile having the big ones with the little ones all around it. It's like yeah. Keith, is this your camera for document this occasion? Yeah, I, I, I do a lot of videos. Mm -hmm. Positive social environmental justice. Is, is oh, on the list. Put it on the channel TV. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it back on the uh, Facebook. Yeah. Just, uh, oh, right. I didn't submit one. Everyone was after you. Yeah, you're sorry. Right. So you did not submit one. Yeah. It's all there. Yeah, it's all it's all synop great synopsis and everything. Yeah. I didn't know well, what I had. Hmm? It was quite a process.